Yes, and StreamYard is telling me that uh, we are live. I think this is episode, what is it? Seven, eight, nine, ten <laughs> of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no idea. Uh, tonight, I'm really privileged to have you with us and listening to us because I'm quite sure you're going to enjoy the session because I'm privileged to have a good friend with me, uh, Claire Agatha. Um, and we're just going to chat. We're going to chat about how life has changed. Um, and uh, well, welcome, Claire. It's nice to have you here again. Thank you very much for having me back. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, at, at least we're using the same uh, streaming platform. So, um, Everything should be hunky-dory. I just want to remind people who are listening live that uh, I can see your posts on LinkedIn and uh, and YouTube. I think Facebook also. Um, so if there's something specifically that you want to ask us, uh, or more specifically that you want to ask Claire, fire away. So... The last few years, wow. <laughs> Is that your only response? Just a yeah, chuckle. It's just 2020 has been the longest year. We're, we're in what month? Um, month 26, 28 of 2020 now. It's it's been it's been a long year. <laughs> 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 I think I've, I've got to I've got to say this because um, Johan and I were chatting about the topic for this particular session, and last week um, I was doing a, a Siam conference for a few hundred people, and I I just kind of felt oh I don't know. So I think it'll be fun just just to chat and and reflect on what's happened, what's changed, because. Anybody who works in service management knows things did get really complicated. And, and I think those of us who've been around for a longish time, you, you always tend to look back nostalgically at, at where you started. And, and for me, that was ITIL version two. And you sit there and think, oh, it was so nice. There was, there was just ITIL. There was only about, what, 11 processes in ITIL version two that you had to worry about. And now, plus one, yeah. yeah, and now like every every week something new comes and you think, oh, okay, what do I need to know about Ubea or Kaizen or Kanban? And it, it's because I work in the training industry as well. It makes it complicated for us knowing what courses to develop. It makes it complicated for our students knowing what to study, you know, what's going to help them get ahead in their career. And, and that was... That was what I wanted to talk about, really, and I'm hoping that that the people watching chip in as well because I think the first the first question is why you know why have we now got a gazillion different frameworks, models, and methods? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that that it wasn't like that always, but the way that these things were presented was maybe in a good book. Um, mm. And uh, the internet has just given everybody the uh, ability to take an idea, turn it into a certification scheme, um, and get passive income. Um, so, yeah, I'm desperately trying to do this. <laughs> I <Same laughs> with <the> that. <laughs> but really, you know, at the end of the day, what I had to say was, you know, in, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, talking about Kanban, by the way, um, you know that there's a, a new Kanban certification coming up from Epson. I'm busy writing the, the, the base I material. Do. You're going to enjoy it. I'm, I'm quite excited about that, actually. We've, we've yeah. got that on our list of possibles for, for development, for e-learning. But I think commercialization is, is an interesting element of this proliferation of, of frameworks and methods. And I think, I think ITIL 
if you look at the journey that ITIL's been on from sort of UK government through to being, what was it, 51% sold through to now being completely commercial, I yeah. do think the industry has woken up to the the financial possibilities that are associated with something if it's a success. I mean, if you look at if you look at DevOps, because I always think DevOps and ITIL are an interesting comparison because ITIL was um wholly owned IP from the very beginning, whereas DevOps obviously is, is this community movement. And you know, one of the first movers in the space was the DevOps Institute, and that was partly set up by people who'd come from the service management space who understood as well the, the you know the benefits of standardizing and having proper syllabuses and sample exams and accredited training organizations but I think to be honest as well understood the commercial possibilities that that came with it and then what you see is 15 different DevOps certification schemes developing um, I, I, I'm not I'm not an agile expert at all, but I kind of I dip my toe into agile social media every now and then and seeing the polite disagreements between the various yeah. followers of Safe and Scrum and all the rest of it, it, it would appear to be very similar in, in the agile community as well. Yeah. So there's a plethora of 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 offerings, even within yeah methods within um, was that your phone? That was, was my phone. <laughs> so unprofessional. <laughs> uh, you know, so if, if, if you think about the amount of people who's offering Scrum certifications, um, and I think what, what IP holders need to, to understand, if, if you're thinking of taking your IP uh, public, by the way, thank you, Alan, um, you, as the IP holder, are responsible for making it work, not the exam institute, um, and definitely not the training organization. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, just from my experience, I was the first person who, who took uh, uh, the DevOps Institute stuff into the market in Africa. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time and effort promoting this stuff. And the moment it worked, everybody else climbed onto the bandwagon. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, so really, if, if it sounds like it's an easy way of making money, it's not because you as the IP holder need to do the development of the bond mm -hmm. creation. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. people come on board. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a, it's a perception that I get a little bit frustrated with sometimes that, selling training and certification is is kind of a license to print money because as we both well know it, only... it's absolutely not and and you know that there has been there's there's been the recent um change within the ITIL scheme where every exam now comes with the associated car volume and that means the prices have shot up and one of the reddit forums that i hang out in you know somebody was saying oh it's it's this feels like you know axelos is colluding with the training organizations to make money and and i i kind of went in there and said you know yeah. training organization here we i wish we got to collude i wish but we don't get mm. to collude and it it's it, there's always this kind of weird um tension I think between the intentions of, of the, the training community and the actual end customer behavior. Um, you know, if, mm. again, if we take ITIL as an example, very rigorously controlled training market, you know, companies are assessed, um, courses are assessed, trainers are assessed with this intention to drive quality through into the market. And then when you look at what 99% of people want to buy, it's the cheapest possible route to certification. And if that's mm. a, a crummy $10 bit of, of video, that's what they'll use. And, and you know, it's not it, – I've always believed in quality. You know, we, we, we always invested – a lot in our e-learning development we provide tutor support you know every, every 24 by 7 technical support everything's there but we don't 
we don't create the market. The market mm. forces shape the the the, the training that, that is offered. And yeah, it's it's a bit of a you know, certifications a license to print money. Mm, not really. Um, <laughs> no. No, you know, that's that's a a a, a um a delusion that fe- lots of people realize soon. Mm-hmm. And then what happens in the market if you You've got a substandard product um, with a inexperienced trainer because that's the only way that you can make money. And then it's a race to the bottom. Yeah, yep. I'm 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 not an ATO of any of the exam bodies except for Exxon anymore because I'm sick and tired of this race to the bottom. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I stopped being an Axlos slash people said ATO. What's it? Nearly three years ago, two years ago, um, because yeah, if what I invoice the customer, the exam is more than my part of the bill. Yep. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, so it, it's really getting to a point of, of just absolute absurdity. Mm. Um, and let's face it, there's other ways that people can learn stuff. Yeah. Uh, I do. Um, I spend a hell of a lot of time learning stuff just straight off YouTube, listening to mm. intelligent people, having intelligent conversations and doing show and tells. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not negating the need for formal training and certification. I know, you know, it's it's a way to to sort of prove to prospective employees, uh, employers or, or even customers that you know your stuff. So mm. I think it's still valuable and still important. Um, but it has become a bizarre industry. Uh, yep. So can I tell you a quick joke? This, <laughs> can I be this guy is, <laughs> is crawling in from from the Sahara de- Desert into a little tent town. And he goes to the first tent and he said, water, water. And the person says, no, 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 we, we only sell cake. Okay, next one. Water, water, please, water. He says, no, we only sell jelly. Oh, I think the Americans call it jello. Um, and keeps to the next one and says, water, water, says, no, we only sell hundreds and thousands. So he thought to himself, this is a trifle bizarre. <laughs> okay, stupid joke. I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but it's it's not only the training industry that's going through a lot of turmoil. I mean, you're involved in two organisations. You're involved in a training organisation, ITSM Zone, um, and you're involved in in Scopism, which is sort of a consulting coaching company. And wow, who would have thought that's what consulting and coaching would look like? Um, sitting on Zoom calls. Um, <laughs> Uh, not being able to use a whiteboard. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you tell me. A whiteboard on the PC is not the same as sitting with people <laughs> in a room and being able to draw stuff. Um, yeah. So for me, that was a that was a big shift, a difficult mm. shift. Yeah, and and it's. I mean, I when I set up Scopism, um, what six years ago, our flagship idea at the time was virtual consultancy and we thought it was you know this is the best thing in the world why not have a consultant for a couple of hours a week um why do you have to have them in the office the best person for you could be on the other side of the globe um and to be honest at the time no one was interested It, it was it was just you know not the done thing and then in the last the last couple of years that has changed completely um and and it's when we were talking about this kind of proliferation of frameworks and models i do always feel a little bit guilty because there is my name on a couple of books that are out there (laughs) so you know with with scopism we wrote the siam body of knowledge and you know we didn't we didn't invent siam siam already existed we were just kind of pulling in ideas from across the industry yeah. but then you and I were some of many collaborators on the Verizon projects as well and 
in a way, it feels like we are, we're always trying to find the answer to the question. And none of these things are perfect because if they were perfect, we'd, we'd never need anything else. But we're always trying to find a set of practices or patterns to apply to the the problems that we're experiencing. And, and a lot of that's driven by the shift of organizations to digital products and services, to move from waterfall to agile, to, you know, things are never finished. We're in this constant state of reinvention and, and nothing is a perfect answer, but it is, yeah. it, it's, it's a challenge for professionals and it's a challenge for organizations to find the pieces of the things that will create their answer to the question. And that's that's what we tried to do with Verism was use tools like the management mesh to, to allow organizations to visualize, well, you know, we've we've got some sort of legacy ITIL practices, but we've got agile software development that doesn't mesh very well with our budgeting and our business case processes. So how do we make all of these things fit together? And I think last time I was here, I mentioned this this concept of a a mutable operating model, which is one that supports continuous transformation. And mm. that will require, you know, new ways of working to adapt to, to different things. And mm. my brain's been running away a bit this week and thinking, so it's kind of like chaos monkey for processes. Let's just mm. let's just go in and break something and and see what happens, just like we do with our technology. What happens when we take change management offline? Yeah. interesting idea let's let's try it i quite like that samir i i, I think the challenge is that yeah you know, there, there was one way that people consumed the offering and all of a sudden there's a whole universe of new tools and ideas out there and we all need to learn how to properly use them um i'm starting to work more and more on 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 training as a workshop rather as training as training. Um, um, but uh, I must admit, um, excuse me. Bless you. Uh, change of season. Uh, I must admit, I haven't found a set of tools yet that will give me the same immersive experience as having bunch, a bunch of people with sticky notes in a room. Um, so I'm quite sure, Jim, you concur. You know, so. I, I mean, I've I've got um, we've been doing e-learning for nearly 15 years now, and the the technology has advanced enormously in that mm. time, and the the things we can do have advanced enormously. And if I look at some of our early training courses now, I'm like oh they were so clunky compared to what we've got now but in in terms of innovation and e-learning there's there are always these constraints that we operate within and the first constraint is the the actual scheme that that we're working with so for example um if we're doing one of the the brm institute courses through apmg we can only make 10 percent changes to the material that's given to us so that's that's a restriction that you tend to have um you know you will have specific syllabus points that must be covered um so that's a restriction that you tend to have the fact that with e-learning you have to reach every single delegate so the same course has to be suitable for an absolute beginner and somebody who is very very advanced it's it's not necessarily that customizable. So one of the things that we did in our last revamp of, of how we train is we call it multi-level training, but basically the information is presented to you and you can dive deeper into it should you need to. So things like definitions on the screen, mm. if you are if you already know what a service level agreement is, for example you can just move past that. But if you don't know what a service level agreement is, you can click and then you see mm. the definition and maybe an example. Um, and the, the final constraint, which we all have is, is cost. Um, yeah. one, of, one of the big things with e-learning is 
your development costs are up front and they are significant. You know, some of our courses don't start to pay back for a year after we launch them mm -hmm. because the, the development costs are good. And, you know, I, I have a set budget for each course that I produce. It's based on what we think the return will be. If you gave me a budget that was 10 times bigger, I could do a lot more fancy things with it. And that that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but it's also market. I mean, mm. yeah. If it takes you, even if you've got a bigger budget, yeah, and you spend it, yeah, are you going to get then get it back in ten years' time? Most probably not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so. It, 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 it's buying behavior as well, and we mm. we have to produce something that meets the the pockets of the people who want to to buy the training. But I do, I mean, I do have these flights of fancy and i remember years ago when axelos first took over the the ITIL suite um and we we did some workshops down in london and we were talking about what was possible and one of the things we were talking about was to move from things like a multiple choice exam to a a gamified exam scenario so put somebody into a situation ask them to make choices and that that was the exam scenario that we went through and again um brilliant idea but so many complications in terms of translations again in terms of cost in terms of making it fair to everybody it, it's yeah and I, I think my my perspective has changed a little bit when you shift from being a training provider to being a training provider and actually being a content provider for training, because you start to understand things like the impact of updates, translations, all that kind of stuff and have a little bit more sympathy for it. But yeah, I think <laughs> it's been a very long answer that, but ultimately, yes, there is space for a lot more innovation in training, mm. but there are also a lot of constraints that apply. Um, and, and it, it, a big thing for me in the e-learning space is trying to make it as as available as possible. And mm. when you're looking from the certification perspective, some of that is the, the translation element too. Yeah. And and the other thing that one should also not you know, forget is that people expect to pay less for an online course. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know... You can say I'm going to do virtual delivery, but even then they say I expect to pay less because you don't have to feed me. Um, yep. That's a, such a small component, yeah? Mm. Um, and, and you really want to, to try and evergreen something mm -hmm. um, so that you can cater for that lower cost, but it's not always possible. No, no. we had, I, um, we had a, a, it was a, a customer well, he contacted our help desk and he basically said, look, I bought this really cheap e-learning from a, a competitor of ours and it's it's terrible. I can't, I can't finish it. I want to buy your e-learning, but will you give me a discount of the price that I've already paid for this rubbish e-learning? <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we didn't. It's, it's it's my phone's uh, turn. Um, so let me just pick it up so it doesn't buzz on the on the table. But yeah, um, I, I think I think Samia. Um, y yes, the market the market is small because there isn't a single IT service management certification. So the market is smaller, and as we've been discussing, it just becomes more and more fragmented. You know. You, you decide you want to learn about DevOps, but then you've got a choice of which of the, the many DevOps schemes do you want to follow? So that then splits the market more and more. So it, it, it is, um, it is, I think, a, a, a size and a, a standardization element. And that mm -hmm. in a way links to the fact that there is no career path in service management. Everybody has a different route. Um, everybody has a different job title we we don't have this kind of i don't know what it would be apprentice to where would we go analyst yeah i don't to, know yeah to a manager or whatever yeah 
Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's happened in 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 most of the IT careers. Mm. You know, so even in in Dev, you can't say you're going to start here and you're going to end there. Mm. Um, but I suppose one of the things that we need to accept is that a good move in your career, most probably today, is a lateral move. Um, it's about growing your experience rather than you know, having a better title. Mm. Um, and us IT people are spoiled uh, because we earn much more than people do in other industries. That's um, true. And then we still complain about our income. Um, mm -hmm. We've got nothing to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, David, yes, I, 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 I love face to face, but that's my style. Yeah, and and mm. uh, that's the way I I operate. It's not always possible anymore. And or yeah, nice to see you, viable. David. Yeah, yeah. And and I think you made a good point earlier, Johan, about the the amount of information that is now available for free. Mm. Um, it's. I've I found it particularly in the last couple of years that I've gone looking for webinars and and just our uh, articles on Medium and just just read enough to know if I'm interested in something and then you can decide do I want to follow this up do I want to part, do more reading on it but mm. in a way I mean you know training has to differentiate itself from the free content there has to be some specific value associated with it but. That the, there is, there is nothing stopping most of us from adopting this curious attitude and this this you know element of lifelong learning, and it it doesn't have to be restricted to your existing job or even the job you want. You know, there's a small part of my brain at the moment that's very occupied with puppy training and watching puppy training videos and reading puppy threads on Reddit and things and. It, it's all great and it all helps us to learn and it all helps us to be more rounded people. Yeah. Um, the, the, the things that I learned working on a help desk 20 something years ago are still some of the most useful skills that I have now. It, it, it's, it's a continual process. Yeah. So what's interesting is uh, there's a f quite a few American universities who's who's adopted this issue of testing out. Um, in essence, they don't care where you get the skills. Mm -hmm. If you pass the exam, they'll give you the credit, yep. which I think is an awesome idea. Um, I know that you know, some of my academic uh, colleagues and friends strongly object to to, to that approach. But yeah, if, if we say that we believe in outcomes based education, why the hell not? Yeah. Mm. Um, why shouldn't I go and find the way that I learn best, learn what I need to do, and then have somebody independently validate that I know it? Mm. And I, yeah. I, I th there was, um, there was a program on the radio here. Um, and it was, it was basically looking at challenging. The, the status quo and one of one of them was about a school in the Netherlands where there are you know no teachers no classrooms no topics and what the children do is they go in and they choose a project that they want to work on so you know I want to build a skateboard I want to learn about space mm. and there are I think they called them coaches but there are people there who will help where necessary will guide them mm. but the assumption is that in learning to make a skateboard there's bits of physics in there you know there's going to be bits of biology there's maths there's english and how they're learning mm. is to a certain extent self-directed and i think this this is another one of the the, the tensions that we have in the existing professional training system is it isn't outcome based you know, if, if you know you need a foundation certificate because the AI program that's going to sift your CV is purely looking for foundation certificates, you will exercise all your efforts into getting that foundation certificate. 
Will you retain anything that you've learned? Can you apply it? Do you even care? Not necessarily. But mm. if that's the thing that gets you into that next job, then that's you're what you're motivated it. to do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And 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 do you know, I mean, I see Suzanne Gladly from from, from Exxon is, is online. Hello, Suzanne. Um be, before I go to your comment, one of the things that I like about Exxon is the fact that all of the advanced or intermediate programs requires that you do something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that there's practical work that's being assessed. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a visual and kinesthetic learner. I'm I'm not an auditory learner. So uh, a standardized test exams for me is extremely diff difficult. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also dyslexic, uh, <laughs> which which makes makes it quite a challenge to have a, a pile of I don't know last count was over fifty certificates. Um, <laughs> Not because I wanted to, because I had Little to. brag there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually not a brag. It's a, it's it's silly. I was I was putting some stuff in the file today, so I'm not joking. I mean, that's the file. I mean, wow. So, okay, it's it's not all certificates, but you know, it's yeah, letters of recommendation and it's things like that also. Um, but it's yeah, I mean. And, and what was interesting for me, uh, one of the certificates in there was my Novell CNE4 <laughs> certificate, um, which I did in the mid 90s. And that was, I started the exam. It was a adaptive exam. So it 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 zoomed into the subjects that I didn't know mm -hmm. to understand how little I know of it. And a lot of the Questions was actually me doing stuff on a physical um, administrator screen, configuring something, mm -hmm. proving and showing that I know what to do. So mm -hmm. of gamifying um, testing so that we've got and also giving different options about, uh, to, uh, to people for, for being tested based on their learning style. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that people are starting to wake up to it and and the guys from Exxon are quite advanced in 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 looking at how to use a more interactive way um, uh, to evaluate because yeah unfortunately uh, the old idle one and two days where your exam was marked by somebody um, by hand mm -hmm. and it was based on a case study um, is not it's not scalable yeah it's yeah. yeah yeah and and it's and i think that's that's the difference between a technical exam and and a a, a practice exam shall we say because with a technical exam in general it works or it doesn't or you know what to press or you don't but with something like service management there are potentially different ways of doing things which are not necessarily correct or incorrect. And that was one of the nice things about the old ITIL version too, was the fact that you were, you were always encouraged to start with, in my experience, mm. in my experience, I would do this because X, Y, Z. And sometimes it was agreeing with the book. Sometimes it disagreed with the book. And that was that was absolutely okay. But you know, I was I was one of the examiners for for the V two things, and you could see some people were at a disadvantage because they were not taking the exam in their native language. Um, I always remember getting a paper through, and the the, the poor person taking the exam had you know numbered every page candidate number on every page and then they'd basically put i'm really sorry my son was poorly last night and i didn't get any sleep and that was it that was all he'd managed to put for the exam <laughs> so nothing nothing's i think nothing's perfect and like you say to, mm. to give people options because options, i yeah. yeah you know i'm i was quite happy doing the essay based exams but the the old ITIL version three complex multiple choice where you've got the mini scenario and then the question's really long and then each option's really long. I'm not very good at that because my attention span doesn't hold. Well, same here. 
Yeah. And uh, I'm not even a first language speaker. So so that brings you know all kinds of other challenges also to the fore. Mm -hmm. So eventually I developed exam techniques to help me answer questions, not because I strongly believe in the answer, but I know if I apply that technique, that must be the right answer. Yes. It's, if it's not the five, it's at least the three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is, I mean, which is a, a pointless exercise. I mean, that's not mm. what we're really trying to do. Yeah. And and I think um, I think that there is because I I was involved in writing V three exam questions, but. I stopped because I just wasn't very good at it. You know, I'm very good at ITIL and service management. Turns out I'm not very good at writing exam questions. And I, I, I do think there's still a huge, a huge element of that within this industry, which is you get the subject matter experts to write the questions. And, you know, X, X in a good example of an organization that, professionalizes this you know this this mm. is education it requires education specialists and mm. it, you know i i recently found about out about the fact they do sort of jargon analysis across the exams to see if they're fair and things like that are, are worth mm. lifting the lid on a bit so that people understand more about how the exam process works because that's you know that, that's another element which is time consuming expensive to set up um and then has this this constant reevaluation and i don't I, I don't always think there's enough appreciation for that necessarily from the people who take the test they don't understand the things that are going on behind the scenes mm. to make sure that 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 things are fair but it's it's interesting to see the people in the chat saying they loved v2 and anybody who's got that yeah, I still badge. wear my red badge. Yeah, yep. anyone who's got that badge is ugly, proud dirty, of it. dirty, pink or purple <laughs> or badge because it means nothing to me. I earned the red badge. Mm -hmm. I think actually some of my examiners wanted to write back, in my experience, your experience doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, were, they were brilliant courses. But again expensive and i think the the training market has has moved away a little bit from that yeah. but the it point was, was, it was a premium product it was a premium product and it was a differentiator mm. you know if you and i mean i i held some of you saw you know certification qualification stuff also um and a long time ago that an idle version two was a differentiator yeah if mm -hmm. you said to somebody that you're an ITIL manager or a CGEIT or a CISA or a CRISC or a whatever it, it still counted mm. I don't know if it if if it's got the same gravitas anymore yeah um what I quite like about and I'm I know I'm coming back <laughs> it's just because I'm I'm fairly involved with with Exxon I'm coming back to what Exxon is doing um, is they've got this new career path um, certifications, which is actually yes, not a certification. It's rather a uh, a credential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which I think is an interesting in idea. Um, and and if we can, yeah, maybe build on that. Yeah, it it may become a differentiator anymore. We we somebody then at least knows that. Yeah, you don't only have the 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 the, the theory and the knowledge, mm -hmm. but also the experience. Yeah, and, and that's why I like courses with a practical element. How the hell can you say you're a practitioner if you haven't done it? Yeah, um, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, mm. yeah, and 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 I think again, this is where the the fragmentation hinders us a little bit because. There isn't sort of one industry body that everybody joins because how amazing would it be, you know, to to take your foundation exam and that means you're certified. But then when you've got some practical experience, that moves you up another level mm. um, and 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 this this career builds with you. And, and that's you, you write about the, the, the career paths things They're They're a nice way to say 
this is something I'm working towards. I'm yeah. not waving a certificate and, to say, this is me. Yeah, and the cool thing that I like about the guy's approach is also they, they don't say it's only our products that count. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's another product with a similar content and whatever, um, especially on the lower levels, they will accept it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an interesting idea that can maybe be explored. <clears throat> so I don't have a traditional um, academic background. So mm -hmm. I, I went to a, um, a Technicon. You would have called it a Polytechnic. Um, so instead of sitting three or three years in the classroom, I spent, spent a year and a half in the classroom and a year and a half doing practical work. Mm. I love it. Um, because I'm a kinesthetic learner, that's good learning for me. Yeah. And yes, it meant that for the first two, three months, all that I did is <clears throat> I carried my chief text boxes and toolbox bag around um, and observed. Mm -hmm. you know, some of the stuff that I observed him doing, I know I will never do because I've also <laughs> seen the disastrous results of that. <laughs> uh, the, the one day he jimmed a, a, a Winchester disc, you know, those big ones that you still plugged in and secured. Yep, and whatever. Yep. He jimmed and, and he didn't work until the, the lid is closed. So he jimmed the switch on the lid and he put the stack in. He didn't lock it. And he forgot that the the screwdriver was was in the in the switch, oh and he God. switched it on, and the thing lifted and crashed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, it, it's um, I do, I do get the sense that the the pace has slowed a little bit in terms of new things coming at us. I don't feel like yeah. there's been as much in the last couple of years but that there is there is still just this this I, I don't know like we want to change our behavior as often as we we change our technology in in the mm. IT space and and I, I sometimes think we're asking the wrong questions yeah but it's an odd to know what the right question is. Mm. Um, I think the organisations that I work with still, there's still a lot of them are focused on implementing, whether that's SIAM or ITIL or whatever it might be. Or, or implement IGEL instead yeah. of being agile. Yeah. That's it, you know, we'll, we'll upgrade ourselves to Agile 2.0 and, and that's it. And th there's more and more chat about outcomes and experience and value and streams. Yes, and I, I think that's nice. That's nice to see because that will then shift the conversation and we can think about the things that we need to bring in in order to do that and, and kind of case in point at our Siam conference last week, we had four or five talks that were focused on experience. So mm -hmm. using experience level agreements in a Siam environment from Siam to XIAM, Xiam, which I thought was quite brilliant, but also hope doesn't take off. <laughs> it, it doesn't take hold. Yeah. Uh, I, I looked at it and said, brilliant, brilliant concept. Yeah. Yeah, but please let us not start another thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I think that's because um, Siam tends to be quite uh, quite low level. You know, you're very focused. Who are all the service providers? What are all the contracts? What are all the agreements? How do we build the end-to-end -end measurement? And and to, to look at it all through the experience lens is extremely helpful and, and yeah. focuses what needs to be done and please let it get us away from this whole IT and the business nonsense which we still seem to talk about. Yeah, I'm 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 actually hearing the business talking less about it and yeah I'm I'm starting to wonder if the problem isn't IT. We don't want to be part of the business. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're special. Yeah, we're special. Yeah. Okay, so um, just want to see. Yeah, uh, what does David say? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, we. Mm. we but I think we can, we can do much more in terms of helping people to to in a meaningful way plot their career and help them with their career. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, some of that may mean um, that we would training organizations needs to do stuff that's not training. Mm -hmm. That's more career path coaching. That's, yep. uh, but then people must also realize that, you know, it can't happen for free. Mm. Um, and I mean, I've got a mentor and a coach and, I value every single second with him. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. If it wasn't for him, he, I would have made m much bigger mistakes in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a quote from John Peel, which is I never make stupid mistakes, only very, very clever ones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that a is, mistake is only a mistake if you didn't learn from it, eh? Yeah, but that that is, I think, the I guess the thing we've not touched on, which is do organisations invest in people? And I, I forget what the latest figures for the UK are, but the the kind of the training budget that's allocated to your typical employee is maybe a hundred pounds. It's yeah, it's, it's negligible. And yeah. as we shift to kind of maybe the gig economy, you know, my multi-portfolio working, even just outsourcing of different elements of the business, who is taking responsibility for people's development? Do we accept yeah. now that it is 100% our responsibility for our own development? Should organizations be investing more? You know, for me, it's Yes, it's nice to send people on training courses. As a training provider, I wholeheartedly support that. But are you letting people go to events? Especially now, they're all virtual, cost nothing. But, you know, yeah. are you letting people go to events? Are you giving them time as well? That's the biggest mm. thing, time to reflect, time to apply. What happens when they come back from learning something? Do they have any space to play with that new knowledge and mm. I, the impression I get is and we, we no. see this with some of our our kind of bigger e-learning clients is they will buy the licenses for their team but they're not necessarily giving them any time in order to do it they're not necessarily they don't even measure sometimes do people finish the training Whereas we always encourage them, you know, if you if you train in a group together, once you reach a certain point, why not have a workshop and start to think about how do we apply this in our own organization? What problems could we solve? And, and you know, then they're getting the value for the, in, the investment that they've made. It's much more rewarding for the, the staff that are learning as well. That there's, But again, this, this comes back to, aspiration and desire from the training provider side compared to the reality of the market and we you know we can't force people to behave in a certain way yeah but i do think there's there's a shift busy happening as people start embracing you know a more lean approach to mm -hmm. to uh, to management and leadership from a philosophy perspective um so that incorporates things like you know agile and 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 uh, uh, DevOps and yeah, you know, these type of environments also is that I think managers and leaders are starting to realize that their role is changing in the organization. Mm -hmm. We're working with smart people. We don't have to supervise them. Uh, the the purpose of a leader is to build, um, and, and maybe that's the answer. Maybe the the answer is that it's your manager's job for you to have a career path. Mm -hmm. um, and and to help you grow, um, and whichever way then they think will fit into, it's sort of like having a coach, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so so 
you know, my coach would from time to time say to me, we can have a conversation about this, but do you know what? Go and read that book. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, um, there's a really brilliant movie that, that I saw uh, on that. By the way, the other day we were talking and he, he reminded me that every 1st of Jan he watches Kelly's Heroes. Mm -hmm. for, because for him, it's the epitome of what um, a working capitalist society should be. Yeah, <laughs> authority doesn't count. Yeah, because yeah, the, the guy who organised the whole thing was demoted to 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 uh, to a private. Um, yeah, um, if you're there first, you, you deserve the reward. Um, if you collaborate with others, you'll most probably be successful. Remember, the, the, the gold was loaded into the German tank to take it away. <laughs> and he went on and told me about all of these lessons that he learns from Kelly's heroes. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I might start watching Lord of the Flies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, sometimes you can also learn what not to do, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think it goes... It goes right back to school as well and what what we're teaching people in school. Are we teaching them to, to question, to think critically, to find information themselves? You know, going back to that example in the Netherlands I was talking about, because there's a lot of schools in the UK, you know, you come to school, you put your mobile phone in a box or whatever at the front of the classroom, you don't use it. They're encouraging the kids to use their mobile phones because – one, that's how you find information, but two, they were learning appropriate behaviours and they were learning how to be safe on the internet, to use the internet in, in a productive way. I'm, I'm, I'm working with, um, it's not kind of a public project yet, but I'm, I'm part of a group at the moment with a UK university and they're looking at launching a new exec MBA programme and what they've done is pulled in lots of people from different industries to re-look at the syllabus and say, mm. you know, does does an MBA actually teach you what you need to know to be to be a, yeah. a, a successful business person now? And that's a fascinating project. You know, some of the discussions that we're having, uh, it, it's things have changed, <laughs> really, really changed, and and technology is a huge part of that. Mm. Yeah, and I, I I think that's wonderful that people are doing it, but they must also change their. I don't know how to pronounce this in 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 English, um, <laughs> the, the, the the way that they put the learning program together and yeah um, and yeah, because for me, I mean, this fixation with time mm. um, in 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 uh, tertiary education institutions is stupid. Yep. Yeah, if I can learn something in five minutes, why do I have to spend five hours on it? Mm -hmm. um, um, and that's what those kids in that those schools are learning. Mm. Incidentally, the method that they use to do their projects is Scrum. Yeah. Um, so, and um, uh, there, there is a danger though, and and the the coach it's the coach's responsibility to make sure that that you still leave school with a rounded education. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest tragedies in, in the way that syllabi has changed in schools today is that it's not good, broad education anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Do, do kids still read Shakespeare? They should. Yeah. How, how many people uh, is doing a, a another language? Yeah. Uh, Latin is a good one. Because mm. then you can read all the classics in the real. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> now I'm, I'm just joking. I'm, I'm not saying that. I force my kids to actually do a a, a European language at school, mm. just because it's so foreign to their current experience, mm -hmm. and uh, with good results. I mean, Adrian is now operating as a lawyer in Germany in German. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an opportunity that he would have never had, uh, yeah, if that was not the case. Um, reading the classics, yeah, the Iliad, yeah. Um, um, uh, reading philosophy, 
yeah and and that that kind of comes back to to being a rounded i guess business professional as well you know latin latin gives you a root set that then allows you to learn a lot of other things access a lot of other material and and as 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 a as sort of a business professional there is that that base lot of knowledge that you need you know if you work in it you should understand marketing you should understand sales you should understand hr you should understand finance because this is all part of the environment that you mm. operate in and and it's maybe that is that it business gap is that you get people whose heads are purely in one space but you should also appreciate beauty yeah so oh, okay. how much time is spent on the arts mm -hmm. um, because that's what makes life meaningful yeah yep um yeah so now i'm getting philosophical we need to change the the subject <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think the and again because i'm getting very old now very old and sad but in the good old days yeah well no i'm thinking the next the next generation seem really switched on and mm. a lot of a lot of the people that i speak to who are coming into their careers now very much have an appreciation for the purpose of what they're doing and the benefit of what they're doing and the work life balance that they want and you know when i when i started it was just kind of work 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 really hard advance yourself get up the career ladder but i, I think the next generation are looking at things differently or certainly yeah. the, the the people that i'm speaking to and that's that's a positive that is a positive yeah it's a generational thing though because hmm. my my oldest and youngest the first three and a half years um I see much more of my behavior mm -hmm. in the elder one than in the younger one. Uh, wow. It's just, yeah, no, it's it's amazing that how much, how big a difference three years actually makes mm -hmm. um, in 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 one's outlook on on life. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, life has changed like, like the the world that we live in is strange and it's different and mm -hmm. but it's not bad um, no it's just different mm -hmm. um and i think maybe as gen xers um just find it difficult to cope uh, mm. and luckily i've always been a a person who likes change yes maybe because i can't concentrate too long <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah dyslexia and adhd is not a good combination <laughs> look at where it's got you uh, i don't know I'm, I'm 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 happy and i'm i'm doing stuff that's meaningful to me um mm. and i think that's also important yeah is, mm. is the fact that you can smile, yeah. You know, when you when you close your PC at the end of the day, yeah, you can smile, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and you can do other things like mm -hmm. um, trying to potty train a uh, uh, a, a uh, what's the breed you've got again now? Cocker spaniel, a, a cocker delinquent spaniel. cocker spaniel. <laughs> um, or for that matter, how to find your sea legs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I've decided I'm going to start blade bowls again. Yeah, long bowls. Nice. Yeah, I'm nice. at the age that I that I can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in the army, I I I, I played for my unit, um, but that was more of a joke than than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's always these old yeah majors <laughs> and sergeant majors and yeah. Um, Colonels and stuff that was playing, and I was I was the only non commissioned officer yeah, that that was playing bowls. <laughs> uh, funny, anyway. That sounds like a very appealing thing to do. Yeah, 
Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a club not far away from us. I reckon about a block and a... Not even if... Yeah, it's not walking around the block. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. halfway around the block and then I'm at the club. So, right. yes, work-life balance, important thing. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think that you've got work-life balance? I still don't think I have. I don't know if I know what that means, to be honest. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> yeah I, I have. So I, th I think I think for one thing, it's different when you own your own business because yeah. the the concept of switching off is it's, it's less available. Because if something goes wrong, you are on the hook. There is no choice about that. But equally, I find what I do incredibly stimulating incredibly rewarding mm. so i see no issue with that um i have weeks where i'm so stressed i feel like my head's gonna burst and i have weeks when i am just in in that flow state and 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 so happy but i have yeah i've i've got i've got a good relationship with my husband I've got family, I've got friends, I've got interests outside of work. So, yeah, I think I think mm. that's balance. Um, yeah. the, the one and you smile. Yeah, that's I, it. I very seldomly see you not smiling. Yeah, I, I am. I am generally content, which is mm. which is good. The, the one thing I would love to have, and I guess it's in my power to do this, but would be to have even a month just take a month off and do nothing work related you know no social media no emails no nothing i would go nuts <laughs> but nice to have the opportunity because when, <laughs> did, when did we last do that you know school know, school remember. holidays as a as a kid um yeah was was the last time i did it because you know people say oh you'd be so bored and I think possibly, but nice to have the opportunity to find out. And and also, mm -hmm. who knows? And Jim Jim's in the comments says it's work life integration. And yeah, I, I think that's very true because mm -hmm. most of us are working internationally now as well. So that whole nine to five and done thing isn't there anymore. You know, I've we've we've got a a public holiday on Monday and I've messed up and accepted some meeting invites from a US client because you know they sent the meeting and I thought wow I've, I've weirdly got a free day in the diary yes no problem <laughs> now I realize why <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll it's, just it's take Monday. I'll take the t yeah I'll, I'll take the time some other time when yeah. the rest of the UK is but not you're on fortunate holiday. that you can yeah and yes. not many people can yeah I must admit if if I had to take a sabbatical, and it's something that I'm, you know, that I'm contemplate, contemplating doing, is mm. I'm, I'm looking for a, for a, 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 a property that needs tender care mm. somewhere in the Italian or Portuguese or Spanish platalons, you know, the nice. rural area. Yeah. I, I would like to take two or three months off and go and try and fix something like that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be fun for me. Then I would be yeah. able to switch off because I'll be busy doing stuff and I'll be yes. too dead tired at the end of the day to do anything else. <laughs> yeah. And and there is there's, there's a massive satisfaction, I think, in doing something tangible when yeah. your normal work is with your brain. You know, I'm excited because I've managed. Okay, I'm losing you there a little bit. Okay, I've lost you there for a moment. Yeah, I think um, I dropped out. Okay, so we're on the hour, um, and I've um, after my first uh, first session of nearly three hours, and then one of two and a half hours. I've, <laughs> <laughs> I've promised people to keep it to an hour. Um, no one needs that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 
Claire, it was awesome to have you and uh, to to chat about, I, I think, yeah. some stuff that's really important. You know, that, um, and it's most probably worth exploring a little bit more. Mm -hmm. If there is some closing remarks that you could want to do about the reflections that we've had today, what would that be? Uh, I, I think I'm I'm happy with where I am because it's never stood still and I've always been curious about new things and I do believe that that is the mindset that we all need to work for now and I, I think everything that we've been talking about in terms of the importance of learning is is the key to a, a happy life um to, to never get stuck in a rut and I, th yeah. I think that's that would be my my key takeaway okay awesome there's a uh, sorry on facebook i can't see who placed the the comment so facebook user yes i when i start that project you're more than welcome to visit i've got some spare tools I'll be there. <laughs> Lynn, thank you very much. I had a blast of a time. Um, thank you for well the invite. You and too. chat soon. So I'm just going to go to the, the, the closing screen and then I'm going to close off. Thanks everyone who's been here as well. It's been, it's been good to see our thoughts. So if you want to have a chat with Claire, there's some contact information. Um, so Scopism is the, the, the consulting coaching company and obviously Ideas in Zone is a training organization. I'm actually currently doing one of her courses. Um, uh, yeah, so learning continues. Um, so good stuff. Go and check it out if you've got any questions. Um, or if you just want to reach out and say hi, there's the contact detail. And then from my side, just to remind you that um, one of my big tasks and missions at the moment is to help organizations with a practical side of you know, changing their organizations uh, and getting it fit for purpose for a, for a digital age. Um, you can buy competing in a, in a digital future currently on Amazon and watch out soon, most probably mid-May, the next book is out coming out, uh, out competing uh, or out innovating uh, the competition. So that's it for me. Thank you for attending. I had a lot of fun. Hope you had too.